through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 187. Woo. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of The Master, yes. we're going to be talking about Philip Seymour Hoffman. Good old Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about a little bit of him, too. Well, yes. Uh, Not surprising. Philip Seymour Hoffman, very talented dude. Mm -hmm. uh, started his career really known as a character actor. Mm -hmm. Kind of evolved into more than that. So it's going to be a fun little journey we got here. It is. Let's start back in the mid-90s, though, with a film that I am a big fan of, <laughs> Twister. I'm not surprised that you're a fan of Twister. Really? Yeah, I'm just... What, what about Twister Scream Spencer? I, I just... Terrible? You seem to be rather uh, um, pro-disaster movie. I do like disasters, that is true. Whether that's just because you like the special effects or you actually like disaster movies, you tend to be on the liking okay. side of the disaster type Fair movie. enough, fair enough. Not that I dislike Twister in yeah. any way. I'm just simply saying. As, as, the, as the name implies, this is a film about um, a tornado no. chasers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tornado chasers, yes. uh, directed by Jan de Bont. Um, who is the, also the director of Speed, so gets it off on a good start with you, Greg. Yeah. And Woo. Speed 1 and 2, I believe. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, um, this is a story about, you know, a couple mm -hmm. separated over time or brought back together it's over a Helen divorce. Hunt? And Bill Paxson. Yes. Okay. And she's still a storm chaser. He's a weatherman or something now, and he gets sucked back up into the chase. <laughs> Sucked back. Yeah. <laughs> a, a, a tornado, tornado. Tornado puns. <laughs> and Philip Seymour Hoffman plays one of Helen Hunt's sort of like crew mm -hmm. of motley assistants. crew of uh, yes. assistants who are really into chasing the storms. Yes. It's like him. Um, Alan Ruck's one of them. You know, right. it's it's a really ragtag mm -hmm. operation for <laughs> sure. And I think you know, for me, I think that. Obviously, the effects are pretty cool for yes. the time, especially. I still think they hold up fairly well. Um, but there's also sort of like a couple underwriting stories that are really interesting. I mean, there is sort of the romantic element to it between yes. Helen Hunt and uh, Bill, Bill Paxton, Paxton, where they're sort of like this Strained, love. Strained, old love, yeah, back together. So. Exactly. And so there's that element. But there's also the element of, you know, science, trying to understand yes. the storms. And there's also the, like family history angle where Helen Hunt's father died That's during right. Twister. They go down to a, like a storm shelter, yes. but the doors won't lock. And so yes. he's trying to hold them close and he gets it's, like sucked off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sucked off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're 12. <laughs> yeah. like, I feel like I should clarify. <laughs> he gets whisked away whisked in the storm, away. Like, never to be seen again. Like, uh, you know, what's it called? Like uh, a Hoover vacuum. <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Sucked right off. Wizard of Oz, I'm going with. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know it's a really a really neat film and I love mm -hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman's role as sort of like the comedic relief of the team like yeah. he's got like kind of where that character sound system kind of mentality came from or at least a stereotype I think he kind of steals a lot of the scenes he's in because he's sort of like got this like childlike wonder of the whole experience uh -huh. where he's so excited about everything he's got like the stereo <laughs> blasting and that's his, right like, yes is a van or is a truck bus I think it's a bus um truck boat truck I don't think it's a boat truck. <laughs> but he's got like that blasting. He's yes. he's he's responsible yes. for like carting around then Bill Paxson's yes. fiance fiance, Jamie Gertz. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a fun film. I really it like it a lot. I, I think, you know, it's nominated for just visual effects and sound awards, but I think it deserves more credit than that. It's so. an interesting film for where it lies in time too, because it's the first ever film released on DVD. Really? Yeah. It was also the last film ever released on HD DVD. That wow, lived. that is fascinating. Yeah. That is a good. That's a good. That's a good trivia mm -hmm. fact right there. Yeah. Just to, an interesting point in time to see where it's like. Yeah. Way to bring something to the game, man. Every now and then, yeah, Spencer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll move along into a more character-driven film, mm -hmm. Boogie Nights. Yes. From Paul, Paul Thomas, Thomas Anderson, Anderson, who's also working with them on The Master. Mm -hmm. uh, several things, actually. I mean, yes. you know, they worked together on, was it Punch Drunk Love as well? Yes. You know, I think he was in Magnolia yes. as well. So Definitely. they've done a lot together. Yes. 
big time collaborators. Uh, Boogie Nights, story of a rise and fall of a porn star, so to speak. Yep. Dirk Diggler, played L by Mark Wahlberg. Loosely based on John Holmes, mm. the actual porn star. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Including elements of his life, like the Wonderland murders that he was wrapped up right, in later, yeah. which is the basis and, for that yeah. movie. Uh, yeah, it, that movie, and as well as the whole uh, hold up at the, near the end sure, of sure, Boogie sure, Nights. Sure, sure, yeah. so. uh, you know, it's it's kind of a weird movie. I like it a lot, but it's got a lot of different things going on. I mean, there are a lot of different narratives going on. Definitely. You know, you have, uh, let's see, you have Burt Reynolds, you have Julianne Moores, you have John C. Riley yes. sort of tagging along with Mark Wahlberg. Don Cheadle as his own yes. one. Yes, Heather Graham to a certain extent. William, William H. Macy as an De abbreviated yes. one. Yes. Um, though a very important one in the plot. <laughs> yeah. Phillips, oh, Phillips Raymore Hoffman's role is kind of kind of weird in but that awesome awesome i mean he plays <laughs> part of the the porn crew yeah the film crew i who, think he's like sound like gaffer or something. yeah i mean he, Best he boy he has a, a certain appreciation for the stars mm -hmm. um yes. so to speak and sort of an unrequited credit yes like unrequited unrequited love, yes love it makes a pass um, at mark Wahlberg's character yeah unfortunately i'm sorry I'm yeah fucking idiot. and you know it's there's the thing about the movie it's got a lot of funny parts, but also it's really more of a heart-breaking kind of story. I mean, yes. you know, everybody has their sort of, like, shit go sideways. Yes, the I mean, rise right? and fall of the porn industry. Yeah, I mean, that's really... Dirk Diggler. Yeah, I mean, it, his, his rise occurs right as sort of, like, videotape mm -hmm. happens, and that's yeah. sort of, like, when things change the first time in porn. Like, the internet has essentially done the same thing that Indeed. direct video did, too. But, um, you know, like... Unrequited love for Philip Seymour Hoffman, yes. William H. Macy's wife, essentially cheating ruins, on him with everybody. Yeah, ruins his <laughs> life. Um, Mark Wahlberg's life does not work out how he quite imagined. It's you know, it's 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 really a tough, tough film to watch in a lot of ways, but really, really well executed. Yeah, it's got so many different facets to it that that's one of the things that I enjoy about it so much is that even though you have seeing all these characters and their various you know, s fall or s low points in their mm -hmm. life. It's still this progression of time. I think it takes like about s seven years in mm -hmm. the film. Yeah, yeah. And like 77 to 84, I think is the years it's supposed to mm -hmm. take place over. It's just, just, I think it's just an interesting, almost like a character study in a oh, way. Oh, totally. Just, you know, absolutely. Take a, take a timeline just in the same way that all those like period piece dramas that are popular now in television, mm -hmm. like Mad Men and, and Boardwalk Empire, things like that. You're just like, oh, we're going to take this very specific slice of life at a very specific time yeah. and we're going to show all the characters and we're going to see how the, how all their lives go crazy. No, it, it's, it's really interesting. And this is sort of like the point at which, I mean, you know, Heart 8 was uh, so enjoyed by people by Paul Thomas Anderson in his yes. first film, but this is the film that really brought him to mainstream consciousness. Definitely. I mean, you know, let's see, Burt Reynolds was nominated for supporting, Joanne Moore was nominated for supporting. Yes. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson was nominated for writing hmm. uh, directly for the screen. Um, so it really it brought a lot of people to attention. I mean, I think this was one of the first times Mark Wahlberg yes. got a lot of credit as an actor. Which is interesting because originally Leonardo DiCaprio was offered his role and turned it down because he was doing Titanic, but he suggested Mark Wahlberg. Hmm. Interesting. Imagine how much weirder that would have been. First off, Titanic with no Leo, but yeah. Boogie Nights with Leo. That would have been. Yeah, that would be a big old very fake dong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ladies would have loved it. Yeah. But they would have loved it better. Probably, probably would be flipped. <laughs> yeah. This would be Titanic, yeah. and Titanic would be like, remember, like Boogie Nights. <laughs> It'd be different. Probably. Another sort of character part for him was a couple years later, Almost Famous. Cameron Crowe. Cameron Crowe, inspired by his life. Yes. Uh, where Cameron Crowe was sort of represented by, what's his name? Uh, Pat Patrick Fugit. Oh, yeah. Patrick. He was sort of a youngster who got attached to a band um, as sort of a pre member of the press. Yes. I think it was Rolling Stone. I forget which, yeah. I think it was Rolling Stone who um, Cameron Crowe was connected to. Oh, oh, to, oh, yes. Um, when he started hanging out with the band. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it's inspired by him. And um, it's, it's really interesting, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman plays a sort of mentorship role to Patrick Fugit in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know what the equivalent would have been for uh, Cameron Crowe. But, you know, so many people really popped out of this movie. Patrick Fugit popped out of it. Kate Hudson blew yes. up. Like, yes. I know. I, I mean, I'm sure she I did. knew that, you know, there are children for, uh, what's her name, Goldie Hawn. Yeah. But this is like I don't the think point. I knew she was an actress at all. Yeah, I don't think thing. until yeah. this. And then yeah. ever since this, she's been like a star. Yeah. Like, yeah. this is sort of one of those movies, sort of like Jim Carrey with Ace Ventura, where it's yes. like that first just film out, boom. like instant stardom. Mm-hmm. And it was just, definitely, it was amazing to see the change. Zoe De Chanel oh, plays a right. small but intricate role yeah. as Patrick Fugit's brother. Uh, the, Billy Crudup. This Billy was Crudup. one of the first times he really got a chance up to Blew up as shine. sort of the lead yeah. member of the band Stillwater in the movie. Yeah. Uh, Jason Lee, another member of Stillwater. It's yes. it's just an amazing group of people. Even smaller characters like Anna Paquin and Feruza right. Balk are in there as well. As sort of, I think, Band-Aids. Yeah, with probably. Our, the groupies. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's really interesting. And, and it's interesting to sort of see Philip Seymour Hoffman in that role as sort of a mentor. In a, for me, this film is sort of a funny one because I remember... This occurred right as I was sort of graduating from high school. I remember being in the mall and being offered a chance to go see a sneak preview of a film called, I believe, Stillwater. And we were going to go see it driving from Santa Fe to Albuquerque in New Mexico. It was like 60 miles or about an hour. And our car, like, broke down right about, like, say, 50 minutes along the way. So we were unable to go see the movie. I was like, man, that's a bummer. Jump forward, I moved to Seattle, it's still the summer before I go to college, and I get a chance to go see a screening of Almost Famous. And sure enough, it doesn't occur until, like, I think either after I saw it, or, yeah, probably after I saw it, that it was like, oh my god, that, that was, was the, the movie same that film. I would have seen. Yeah. Who knew? Story time with Spencer. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's like, the yeah, the form. more you know. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yeah. That's my story about Almost Famous. So, I, I mean, I love the film. It's it's really a, a nice it is. Um, coming of age story. It's, an, it's a really good story. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's schedule was so tight uh, when this movie was being filmed that he was only on set for and did all of his scenes in four days. Wow. And not only that, but he had the flu the whole time. The entire time he was it. It's like, I can only be here for these four days, and I happen to be sick. He's a gamer. You know, he steps it up. He does. The f- Professional. I mean, <laughs> the film got a bunch of ones. I mean, you know, Cameron Crowe was nominated. Yes. Not surprisingly, Kate Hudson was nominated. Yes. Frances McDormand as the mom was that's nominated. That's right. I forgot she was in or this. Might have split the vote for supporting. Maybe that's why neither of them won. Possibly. Um, but, you know, it's it's a, it's a nice film. Nice, it nice really film. Is. So. And Cameron Crowe, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Another one I want to talk about that I actually saw in theaters, hmm. State in Maine. This is uh, the film directed by David Mamet. Ah, yes. Written by him as well. Famous and Dave, playwright. Very, very famous playwright. Um, he, let's see, he's done a lot of write, notable writing. He wrote The Untouchables. Mm-hmm. He was a writer on Glengarry, Glenn Ross. Yes. He wrote Hannibal, yes. the uh, sequel to, was it Silence of the Lambs? Yes. Yeah. Um, was, if I remember correctly, wasn't he also connected to like the Spanish? Prisoner? Not only though, well, that's not only, not only did he write that, he directed that. Oh, okay. He uh, directed Heist uh, with yes. uh, Gene Hackman. If you ever saw that yes. one, he directed Spartan with Val Kilmer. If you ever saw that one, so he's really, really good. Sort of, um, I don't know if you want to call it mystery or thriller type writer. Mm, like he's yeah. really good suspense, at sort of maybe. Yeah, suspense would be a good one. Yeah. He's really good at sort of like. Um, ex- having a plot gradually unfold yes, so yes. you know it's it's really a very c- nice a good complicated uh lots of twists yes exactly yes. and state and maine is not that movie really no what is state, state and maine, maine about? state and maine i i will be honest when i saw a list before filming i was like i've never heard of this movie before. state and maine was one of the first times i really saw philip seymour hoffman in a larger role i see essentially he plays an author who sells his work to become a film um, which, needless to say, would be very exciting. You know, it's it's got some major actors in it, played by major actors. Alec Baldwin and Sarah Jessica Parker play these stars who are going to be in this movie. Hmm. They basically take over, I think it's a small main town? I don't remember where it's. it's Massachusetts. Massachusetts, so okay. Up, maybe. And they take over the small town and essentially, like, totally screw it sideways. Like... Uh, Alec Baldwin's character gets involved with a teenager played by Julia Stiles who has like this <laughs> car accident and all sorts of crazy <laughs> shit going on like they're trying to change this nice little story that um, 
sort of morality story that okay. Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is into like a more Hollywoodized version of it. So they're having him do all these changes and stuff. So and is he pl he's playing the actor? Or, I mean, the writer? Yes. Or, or... He, I mean, he's sort of like the main guy in a, okay. in a way, in the sense that he, it's his story, and he's I having see. to, like, navigate all this, hmm. like, Hollywood chaos around him. So and he's, he's the main who's the state. But Yeah. Oh. Um, and I should note it has Rebecca Pigeon in it, who was the like... female lead in Spanish Prisoner. Oh, yes. She, okay. She's great. She's a okay. wonderful actress, yes. doesn't get enough uh, screen time, but she sort of plays... Uh, I think she runs the hotel he's staying in, or they're all staying in. Interesting. And she sort of is the only one who gets him and sort of understands what he's trying to do. And sort of it's sort of a romance between the two of them. It's got this chaos he's trying to navigate while trying to maintain the integrity of his work. And, I mean, it's sort of an interesting story because, you know, David Mamet's a writer, so yeah. I'm sure he's done a lot of tough things like that so i can appreciate <laughs> that but it's very different from a lot of his other work so i appreciate that i appreciate um philip seymour hoffman's work as the lead in trying to under navigate all this chaos and you know it's just it's kind of an interesting story sort of a look at the world of hollywood behind the scenes uh definitely not my favorite work of his i, I love <laughs> spanish prisoner great film yeah um heist is is very good too and even spartan's kind of an interesting mystery with um Kristen Bell. Kristen Bell oh, okay. plays, I think, the daughter of a diplomat or something who gets kidnapped and Val Kilmer is tasked with That's rescuing her. Yes. So, from the like sex trade industry or something like that. So, um, yeah, no, uh, Stay in Maine, definitely not my favorite of his work, but it's okay. You know, it's kind of funny to see all these people back before, you know. This was Alec Baldwin before Pre 30, 30 Rock. Rock yeah. um, this is sort of when he was sort of low in his career. Yes. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker, this is probably. Maybe the start of Sex and the City. Yeah, really early on when that was all going on. You have like Rebecca Pigeon, who's great. Julia Stiles, sort of right as she was ramping yeah. up. So it's, uh, huh. it's interesting. an interesting one, yeah. Good cross-section of people. Yeah. We're going to jump forward to another uh, lead performance of yes. Philip Seymour Hoffman's. The one that probably, not probably, definitely sort of cemented his role in America's consciousness yes. is most uh, critically acclaimed at the very least role. Definitely. Capote yes. playing Truman Capote. Mm -hmm. This is his Oscar winning performance as the um, lead. Yes. Uh, story Lost 40 pounds for the role. Yeah. Uh, this is the story of the writing of In Cold Blood which is Correct. the um, incredibly popular book that Truman Capote wrote about um, a murder that was committed by a couple individuals who are in prison and he goes and essentially I think it's I mean you describe it as befriends them in okay. some ways in some ways it's sort of sympathetic towards them um, but essentially he he, meet, he goes to these the prison and meets these murderers and sort of learns their story and turns that into a novel and it's sort of like um it's sort of the story of like him learning about their, their the truth behind them is the bond the weird bond that he sort of develops with these murderers well, and sort of the process of their motives yeah and trying to, well also being heads. also being sort of sympathetic towards them sort of becoming friends with them at the same time you know um throwing them under the bus yeah, or in this book yeah, and all this yeah. sort of stuff. It's it's a sort of a complicated morality story. Interesting. That, I mean, he's great in it. It's a really, a really um, beautiful film visually. It's directed by Bennett Miller, who also worked with him on Moneyball. Oh, yes. Um, which, again, another very visual performance. Mm -hmm. And strangely, Moneyball and this are really the only notable credits for Bennett huh. Miller. So, dude needs more work, clearly. The film was shot in 36 days, so considering how beautiful it is, that's, I mean, you clearly have your, your everything's planned out at that point. Yeah. Like, all right, here we go. Boom, and, boom, boom. You know, you got, um, uh, like one of the murders, Perry Smith. I mean, the story is based on reality. Like, this is yes, a real yes, murder right, that yeah. occurred. Sort of like, um, Helter Skelter, mm. uh, if you ever read the book uh, about the Manson murders, the same gotcha. sort of thing like that, a true crime. Like This is one of like the f books that created the true crime genre. Hmm. Um, but you have like Clifton Collins Jr. as one of the murderers who he sort of befriends, in particular him. And you got, it's 
Truman Capote is such a weird dude. Like, one of his best friends is played by Catherine Keener. Who okay. plays Harper Lee. Oh, okay. Who, I believe, wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. yes. So, like, it's really weird to sort of see Harper Lee in like another context. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's, it's a really, it's just a very interesting sort of American story in the moment and it's i mean he won the academy award um the film was nominated for best picture lost to crash um you know the film <laughs> was nominated for best i thought about crash yeah, yeah it was nominated for best director lost to ang lee for brokeback mountain so it was a tough year to go up against yeah. other ones so yeah. the fact that he won best actor serve seems even more impressive because yes. I, I mean i believe heath ledger was not made for yeah, best I, actor. I you're right. So, um, and just, it's just awesome for Philip Seymour Hoffman after all this time and all this work to get a best actor role. Totally. And I mean, he jumped straight to best actor. Yeah. I mean, it's it's weird that he never got any nominations before that. He has since gotten two other ones for supporting actors. Finally. He, he got uh, one in 2008 for Charlie Wilson's War. Lost to Javier Bardem for No Country for No Oh, Woman. yeah, sorry. Makes total sense there. Sorry. Charlie's Charlie Wilson's Wilson War. Charlie's, Charlie Wilson's War. Really a weird film. I don't know if you ever saw it. I haven't. Another one based on a true story about like a guy who essentially funded um, the conflict in, I think it was between Afghanistan and Russia, hmm. and sort of ended the Cold War, Interesting. so to speak. Um, but it's weird to think about, you know, it's basically giving money to Osama bin Laden. <laughs> um, but it's also a sort of like comedy version of yeah, it, not really a dramatic yeah. one. Yeah. So that was weird. And then the second one was for Doubt in 2009. Uh, yes. Kind of ran into a buzzsaw there too. Heath Ledger, Dark Knight. Yeah. So I'm glad you got nominated, but there's no way you're going to win either yeah. of those times. So. But I'm glad that, you know, you're that he's getting recognition. Because, I mo mean... He's moving on up. Yeah. To the to east side. To deluxe apartment in the sky. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to a film that you just saw. Yep. Mission Impossible night. 3. Mm -hmm. This is the J.J. Abrams directed chapter of the series uh, with Philip Seymour Hoffman as the bad guy. Yep. Opposite the Tom Cruise. Big most Rams. expensive first time feature directed yep. Hundred hundred and fifty million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, J.J. Abrams got the role because of his work on Alias. Yes, which makes total sense because mm -hmm. that's essentially a, an awesome spy yes. thriller. Like, yes. did you ever watch Alias? Uh, only smatterings of it. I know Fantastic about show. It. Like the first three seasons of that show are like almost flawless. Uh, the last two seasons are unfortunate um, particularly <laughs> the last one where jennifer garner was pregnant oh yes and that's sort right. of like that, how believe, can you yeah. take the main spy out of it and just like put her in a control room not really <laughs> the best idea um and that was also after she broke up with michael vartan so mm, he essentially yes. left the series in the fifth season so it was really it felt really awkward yes um one of my favorite creations of all though um rumbaldi who's essentially like this leonardo da vinci character who, okay they're finding devices oh, yes, that's for right. and yes. stuff. The entire series. In terms of Mission Impossible Three, though, it's a brilliant sort of spy thrower that actually is more of a character study than a spy thrower. For mm -hmm. instance, the rabbit's foot. Yes, that's the main sort of gizmo <laughs> that they're trying to deal with in the movie. You don't know anything about yeah, it. Yeah, it's a total you never, MacGuffin. It's total MacGuffin. You never really learn anything about it. But essentially, they have to contain it, yeah. or the world will end. The closest you get to it, besides the fact that it has a like you know contaminated radiation sticker mm. on the vial, is the theory that Simon Pegg's character throws out about the anti-god. Yeah. Just the idea that at some point technology will come up with something that will wipe us all out. Which That's I the mean, closest they they allude to it. Which I mean, really, whether it's you know chemical or electronic or what have you that's the concept's basically the same well i think i mean really expensive weapon in the right person's hand the thing about this was especially mission impossible too and we're talking about this in the car ride here was that um mission impossible 3 does the way of taking the fear of the unknown yes because two is essentially a very similar idea where you have a virus mm -hmm. that could you know wipe out humanity if it mm -hmm. gets out and the cure is sort of the thing that you control yeah, people trying with to get, yeah um but and they they break into a facility to do all that sort of stuff. This one you don't know what exactly it is. Yes. And they skip all the like theatrics of breaking into this facility mm -hmm. and trying to get it. Like they just he jumps in, a yeah. couple minutes later it comes out. Busts like, out that's through it. a window with yeah. it. Yeah. And you know they save all the like the action sequences and stuff for other things instead of worrying about that, which yeah. I think was great. Yes, definitely. The action sequences are pretty awesome. I yeah. mean you know blowing up the bridge. Yeah. Or, I, I don't remember how much 
2 did this, but I know that 3 was really big on, like, going to actual real scenery mm. in the world, trying to get permission to film different places. and Yeah, I mean, I, th I think lots two, of locations. 2 was more just set in Australia, yeah, from what I, I recall. Yeah. Um, this is very location-driven, showing real-world places, making it, making it seem like it exists which, in this real world. Which they sort of continued on with 4, which Definitely. J. J. Abrams was a producer yes. on, was no surprise. Yeah. It's the thing about, like, 3, though, is the only action you ever remember about that is the motorcycle stuff and maybe the car in the beginning oh, you mean two yeah sorry two yes the motorcycle scene in the, the beginning with two yes and the cars and thandy newton those are really all you remember this one there's like a bunch of cool actions it's like where he's running through all the um buildings at the yes. end trying yes. to track like down the but, pendulum thing yeah you get on you know, top i mean the whole beginnings like intro scene, with uh, carrie russell scene. yeah i mean there's there's a whole bunch of stuff like that that's just awesome and Two just is so forgettable in a lot of ways. It's really a shame. And J.J. Abrams did such a good job. And the casting was phenomenal. I mean, I was glad they brought back Van Rames. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have Philip Seymour Hoffman as... Um, the villain. As the, the quote-unquote villain. But you mm -hmm. also have sort of these... Um, gray characters yes. of Lawrence Fishburne and, and Billy, Billy Crudup, Crudup. Yeah. which you don't really understand their motivations until the end. Mm -hmm. And even then, I mean, even it's as as the show did and as the mission, first Mission Impossible movie was good at setting up the standard for and three revitalized mm -hmm. it, just the, the, the constantly switching things up, switching things yeah. around, changing things up. I mean, even the like, the little pre, the like open to Mission Impossible 3, which, when it's later, it leaves a mystery that even when it is resolved, is itself another twist and another sure, mystery. Yeah, and yeah. it just, it's a really interesting, like, standard to just know that all you have to do is keep changing up who is who and keep the action flowing, and really, that it, the rest will solve itself. And also, my favorite iteration of the team that he mm. has along with yes. him. You know, I like Jeremy Renner fine. I like, um,. I think Jean Renault's one was oh, kind of an right. interesting yes. one in the beginning. That had a different spin to it. But this one, he had Ving Rhames, who I love in these films. It had Maggie Q, yes. who was incredibly badass. Yes. If you ever seen uh, Nikita, she's oh. great on that show. Ah, this, great okay. on that show. I'll have to watch and it also, yeah, she was really good. Jonathan Rise Myers. Was yeah, he was on. he was really good in that. I was really yeah. happy to see him in another role. Yeah. So, uh, probably my favorite of the Mission Impossible movies. Four, I would say I would say so. Having not seen there. four, yeah. four is great. You should check out four. If you like three, you'll like four. Definitely check it out. So, Phil um, Seymour often plays a very menacing villain for a guy who is not, who's just powerful. It's just this, the level of calm power that he ha that he exudes in the film is very. It's also interesting that this was sort of like one of the first films that came after Capote. Ah, yes. And it sort of it was sort of weird that you know we probably was involved with this before Capote hit it big. Yeah. But a lot I remember a lot of people talking about like why would he do this after all the success of Capote? But sort of like also at the same time, sort of like being a Bond villain. Yeah. There's something sort definitely. of cool about that. Yeah. You know? Definitely. And uh, in terms of awards, sadly did not get really any respect in terms of awards. It was nominated for a few Teen Choice Awards. Always gotta bring those up. Um, Tom Cruise and Kerry Russell were both nominated, both lost. The one that I found the most um, shock and gall over <laughs> was that it was now made for action adventure best action adventure film okay. lost to pirates of the caribbean dead man's chest Ugh. have you seen dead man's chest which one is that that's is that the, the third, third one? one. Oh god that it's one's terrible. so bad it's terrible that one's so bad I yeah saw that one in the theater and i remember like even the teenagers i was seeing that were in the theater as well were like woo <laughs> it's like it's like you know the matrix series yeah. where it's sort of yeah. like two was not as good as one, but it's like, uh, I can but tolerate maybe, this. Maybe they'll pick it back up yeah. after. Maybe it was just and a dip. And three, I was like, oh my god, I literally <laughs> feel like somebody's punching me in the groin. Like, this is what I feel yes. like. I'm being screwed here. Yes, punching me in the groin while shoving something uncomfortable up my back end. Yeah, not good at all. No. One that has developed sort of a cult following with yes. Philip Seymour Hoffman is Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Mm -hmm. This is a Sidney Lumet yes. film. which it's you know, his final film, actually. Yes. Um, guy who's been known uh, around Hollywood for a long time. Done a lot of prolific stuff. Um, yes. He did Dog Day Afternoon, which he was nominated for Best Director for. He did Serpico. Mm -hmm. Did Network, nominated for Best wow, Director yeah. over. Did, did 12 Network. Angry Men, yes. nominated for Best Director. Did The Verdict, nominated for Best Director. Um, prolific dude. Yes. Um, so... Before the Devil Knows You're Dead has uh, developed a, some of a cult following. I know, like, Brandy and Alan are huge fans uh. of it. I think it's very enjoyable. I don't love it quite as much as some other people. I think it's a very entertaining film. It's definitely um, interesting. 
I think I'll say that. I think my favorite part though is the performances. It's not yes. so much of a, a suspense film because you really know what's going on mm-hmm. more or less. But the performances by Philip Seymour Hoffman, Ethan Hawke, and Albert Finney oh, in particular man. are all phenomenal as their a father and two sons. Yeah, and it's one it's one of those uh, stories where it's really kind of where you. I was thinking about this the other day about how it's kind of a, a, a you know where it's going, but it's how they're going to get there the is journey. what is yeah. what you're constantly on the edge of your seat not knowing about. You're like, oh, I know that for, point A is going to get to point B, but how is the path going to be? Mm-hmm. And you, it's interesting to watch because it's kind of non-linear. It, it, it starts with an event. And then that carries to a point, and then it goes to a different character's person. Yeah, they mostly switching between the two brothers' perspective. Yeah, and then the I dad believe. as well. And the dad, yeah, that's right. Uh, and it kind of, it kind of starts at a point, and then slowly goes back and forth, and ends. Each person's story progressively moves past where the beginning of the film was, so you slowly get to the end. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting to sort of see these characters evolve. You know, Philip Seymour Hoffman is sort of like the. Um, the the, miserly well the miserly sort of manipulative yes. like yes. Older, older brother dick brother yeah whereas sort of like initially you know it looks like he's sort of supporting ethan hawk uh-huh. that you sort of twists more. and yeah. stuff like it's it's really interesting to sort of see how it all turns out and you know the film well it might not have gotten any notable awards it won uh, a film of the movie of the year um, from the AFI Awards, oh, wow. which is pretty in- interesting, but got to give a little caveat on that. They give like 10 films okay. of the year, so it's, a, it's not quite like they pick that the best one of the year. Uh-huh. So it's it's neat that he even got that. Yeah. I mean, this is American Film Institute, so yeah. they're the ones that you see all those lists of like Top the greatest best films. movies ever. Yeah, yeah, so that's pretty cool. And um, Indie Spirit Awards, Marissa Tomei was nominated for Supporting Actress, mm-hmm. and it was nominated for Best First Screenplay for Kelly Masterson. Interesting. Yeah, so you know, it's 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 a solid film. I will yeah. say that for it. The, and the acting is great. Oh, that acting is phenomenal, and seeing the characters change as you see their personality they look so much some of the characters their whole portrayal of how they're acted out is different from their point of view to someone mm-hmm. else's point of view that it's really revealing i think it's interesting that the title is based on an irish toast and not only which i'll read here in a second but it's interesting because when they show the beginning credits they show the line preceding the actual title of the movie mm-hmm. and then they show the title of the movie right, so even yeah. that is leading in right and those two lines are part of a bigger toast which is uh may you have food and raiment a soft pillow for your head may you be 40 years in heaven before the devil knows you're dead mm, and it really kind of gives a it, it once you watch i mean especially watching the film but it gives a kind of thematic element of what the film is maybe trying to say or what it's ideas is you know maybe maybe dead a while before the devil knows about it so you don't have to pay for all the things right done in yeah life. well i mean yeah there are definitely some sins that have been oh, yeah. done this way it's interesting to see little supporting roles by like michael shannon yeah too, who yeah great you know i i i don't want to come down da- sound like i'm t- coming down too hard on the film it's a very solid film if you haven't seen it i definitely recommend checking it's on Netflix it out Instant. yep um so, as, is, as is Mission Impossible 3 and Capote, so you can yeah. catch up on yeah, whole Philip probably Seymour Boogie Nights. <laughs> whole Palooza of Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's, it's a good film. It's definitely worth checking yes. out, and it's definitely one of the best Philip Seymour Hoffman performances, yes. I would say. So, yeah. fair enough. Next, uh, brings us to this Friday, mm-hmm. which is September, what, the... That would be... Well, the, 14th? 14th, yeah. 14th? Se- yeah. September 14th. Yes. The Master from Paul Thomas Anderson comes out, which is the story of a naval veteran that arrives home from war, unsettled and uncertain about his future, mm-hmm. until he is tantalized by the cause yes. and its charismatic leader, yes. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yes. Um, you know, this is a phenomenal cast. In addition to Philip Seymour Hoffman, oh you have God. Joaquin Phoenix yes. as the veteran coming back. Yes. Amy Adams. Amy Adams as, as his, like love interest, probably. Well, I think she's the wife of Philip Seymour Hoffman, oh, okay. I believe. Oh, yeah. So there's a complicated sort of love triangle, I believe, that might develop. It looks very intriguing. Yes. And I'm interested because one of the local theaters here, the Cinerama, is going to screen in 70 millimeter. Mm. Yeah. When do you know? Uh, I think when it comes out. That's awesome. Got to note though that the 14th, I believe it goes to limited release okay. for probably New York and LA. I know in Seattle at the very least it comes out on the 21st. Okay. So, you know, we want to tantalize you, but sometimes <laughs> you might not be able to get it yeah. quite yet. So. Sorry. Unless you're in New York and LA, and then screw you. I, you know, it's it's sort of interesting. I mean, got to know a. 
Joaquin Phoenix. I think this is one of the first really major roles he's done since he's returned to acting. Yes. I mean, his... obviously, famously left yes, acting. Yes, for even... his weird pseudo documentary fiction right. film the musician Casey thing. Casey Affleck documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I'm curious to see him get back into that. But he looks like he's really diving back into it, like, f all the way. Because, I mean, Paul Thomas Anderson is really good at taking actors and really just pushing them to emotional limits with their acting. I mean, Magnolia, Boogie Nights, a yeah. lot of these roles, they're just really conflicted people dealing with these horrible moments. And so the fact that there's that this story is even closely related or based on or mm. in relation to L. Ron Hubbard's creation of Scientology yes. may Add, and add to that people like Philip Seymour Hoffman and Joaquin Phil Phoenix being directed by Paul Thomas Anderson and basically an act off and it just sounds like it's going to be phenomenal like incredibly dramatic and you can't underestimate Amy Adams importance oh, yeah, Amy sure. Adams is one of my favorite actresses of say the last half decade I mean yeah, she's she done really, so many good roles and, and so she, different so surprising she is so versatile that's really I think she kind of is underappreciated mm -hmm. because of, I mean she can go from something incredibly dramatic to something like the Muppets yeah like or something incredibly dramatic like yeah. this after doing the Muppets yeah like, exactly that's, that's the main thing that's amazing about her yeah so. it looks really fascinating to kind of see not only the like parallels with the whole El the whole L. Ron Hubbard Scientology angle, but just the the story in general seems really fascinating. Well, also, I think this is the first film he's done since There Will Be Blood. Yeah, I, I think, mean, I think that, you're right. And that was so critically acclaimed. And that was, what, 2009 or something? 2008? Uh, 2008. Yeah. Because that was the same year as No Country for Old yeah, Men. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I mean, that's a while. If it, for... weren't, if it weren't for No Country for Old Men, that thing probably would have won, like, 10 Oscars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I agree. It, it, it was it was tough for him not to win all those, but you know, I'm curious to see him get back on the horse because he his his films are events so pretty good. Much. Yeah. Oh man, and just so I want to see him direct Phil, Philip Seymour Hoffman till one every of them time. dies. Yes, yeah, the, everything they do together is just so good. Yes. So that is Philip Seymour Hoffman in a nutshell. In a little nutshell. <laughs> Give me out help. There's so many other good films he did. You know, we didn't even really talk about Magnolia, Punch Drunk Club, yes. any of that stuff. Let us know which ones are your favorite. Mm -hmm. um, We're not, of course, meaning discount movies also like Happiness and Synecdoche, New York. Yeah, but there's they're so kind many. of harder to sell to the... Yeah, Jack the, Goes Boating, any <laughs> number of things. There's yeah. so many we could talk about, mm -hmm. seriously. What a guy. But let us know your thoughts, and join us next time for our DVD rundown of the week of September 18th. Mm -hmm. As always, you can find us on MacGuffinPodcast.com, yes. Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. Start some or, conversations with us. We're please all do. Place. We like to talk. Yeah. We're talkers. Yeah. Uh, we're on <laughs> iTunes, we're on Blip, Miro, Roku... Check in, get glue, and we will see you next time.